Father, we thank you that you are the center um, of all things, Lord. I thank you that you are the king of the universe, Lord. And we just uh, invite your Holy Spirit to meet with us, to speak to us this morning, Father. Uh, may you just speak through me, Lord. I pray that you would open up our minds and our hearts, Lord, to receive your word uh, this morning. God, we praise you, um, and we love you, and we ask all these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. You guys can go ahead and be seated. Well, good morning. It's good to see everybody here this morning. It's a bright and chilly day um, here in, uh, in Missouri City. So um, thank, uh, excited to, to have everybody here with us this morning. If you are visiting with us for the first time, especially glad that you're here. And be sure to uh, go check the connections table when you leave uh, this morning. There'll be, there's a gift for you. Um, we just love to know that you're visiting with us this morning and pray and hope that you feel um, right at home this morning. And I just want to say hello to those of you watching online. If you're either watching right now live or if you're watching this at some other point uh, during the week or months from now, just want to say hello. And hey, if you're in the area, if you have not yet visited our church um, here in Missouri City, we'd love for you to come, come visit us um, here in, in, at Sienna Ranch. So um, excited about uh, this new series that we're going to kick off here called Built to Last. And so I do have a confession uh, to make before I, I start the series, though, this morning. Um, give you a little bit of an insight in my life, a little bit of, a, of uh, maybe an understanding of, of my life, a little bit, kind of a, not really a secret, but uh, when I was growing up, I was actually short. <laughs> I know, shocker, I know. Um, but um, I, I was actually short growing up, you know. I know you're like, that's impossible, but just kind of work with me here, okay? So, <clears throat> but I, I was, uh, you know, was growing up, and I was, a, I was a good athlete, you know, I wasn't a phenom or anything like that, but I was a good athlete pretty much about every sport um, I played, I was pretty good. But all of a sudden, when people got into middle school, there started to be this discrepancy between me and, and, and the other guys, especially because, uh, you know, they apparently got a memo. Like when you get into middle school, like it's time to grow. It's time to grow and mature. I never got that memo. Never, never got it in the mailbox. I never got, got an email because there actually was an email and then anyway, so I wouldn't have got one. But, I, you know, I never got this, 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 uh, this statement that, hey, like you should be growing at this time. So as middle school went on, you know, people are growing and growing, and I'm not growing. And you can just imagine the challenges that you can endure as you're a, a late bloomer um, and uh, going through, through middle school. And so my parents are trying to figure out what's going on with me. And so we go to the doctors, and, and they run all these tests on me. And they actually find out from the test that I was actually 73 years old. Just kidding. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm 31. I'll be 30 here in a few months. Um, so a little Benjamin Button thing. No. No. Um, they actually did find out that my bone age was two years younger than my actual age. So they said that when typically around 13 years old, that when people have a growth spurt or guys that begin to start to, to mature, that you're just going to, that's going to happen when you turn 15. So I'm still waiting. No, I'm just kidding, but um, <laughs> still holding out. But, uh, but I eventually did grow and, and I went ahead and closed it out at a strong 5'7". So um, representing here today at 5'7". But they actually told me that I had uh, the opportunity, I, I could potentially be 5'9". So, hey, I'm just saying, you know, you never know. You never know. <clears throat> you never know what can, what, what can happen. So anyways, um, you know, I, I share that, that story with you because um, that, there was a, a time in my life where I was expected to grow. There was expectations. The natural course of life is that a, a, a boy at that age was beginning to mature and begin to grow, and somehow I was missing it. Because this, this was the expected time for me to grow, and I wasn't growing. Now, maybe you have a similar story like that, where you didn't grow a whole lot when you were younger. And maybe you have one of those stories where you're like, I grew a foot in college. You know, I was always holding out for that. Uh, never happened. But um, and maybe you don't have a, necessarily a growth story like that. But you know what, it, what it's like to be in a season where you have expected growth, right? Where you're expecting things to move forward. You're expecting progress to happen in your life. Maybe it's, uh, it's professionally. You're at your company, you're at a specific sales cycle, and you're like, we're, we're at the quarter right now where we have all this work that's been put into it. We have this projected growth, and we're expecting things to be turned around. We're expecting things to grow. Or, or maybe it's just something that you, have, you feel like, I, I need to be getting a promotion. It's time for me. I'm in that season of life. Or maybe you feel like that you need to go look for an opportunity elsewhere and say, like, hey, I just need to, I need to grow. This is, I need to be at this certain place at this time in my career. Maybe it's financially. Maybe you have money in your 401k and you're expecting it to grow. And uh, you, you know, you're looking at it and you're putting money in and, and you're hoping for growth. You're like, this is the time for me. You know, not when I retire, but I need it to grow right now. You know, maybe you have 
populated the earth and you're your house is not big enough for your family, and you need to go move into another house, a bigger house, because you got too many uh, kids in your family. You know, some of you guys have been taking that seriously, um, populating the earth. So, <clears throat> and maybe it's relationally, you know, you feel like that, hey, this is, this is the time in our relationship. If you ever remember, maybe you're there right now, or you're hoping to be there when you're kind of dating somebody, and you're like, hey, now's the time that we mean moving into an engagement or moving into marriage, or maybe in your marriage, it's time for you to have kids, um, or maybe it's it's a season where you're like, we just really need to work on our marriage. We need to deepen our marriage. But there's a time when you're like, you know, this is an expected time where we need to be growing. Maybe it is with your child or your grandchild. When you see that, hey, there's some developmental things, you're like, they need to be developing at this path. They need to be able to, 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 to do math at this at level. They need to be doing, you know, English at this level or athletics or whatever it is. You know, we all have these seasons in our life when we expect growth to happen. And it's, what's interesting is that um, whenever that's not happening in our life, we almost intuitively begin to make changes in our life to, to, to make the movement to be able to produce that growth that we're expecting to see. Maybe in a company, you're like, we're not, the sales aren't happening. You're going to redo the sales force. you redo your, um, your projections or maybe just move things around um, uh, to try to help your, your company grow. Or maybe your money's in, in, certain, in the market and you're like, that's not growing. I need to move it into a new fund or move it out of this fund, move it into a stock. Um, you know, that could be it financially. Or maybe it's uh, something relationally. Again, if, if your kid's not moving along, we're like, hey, we need to give them some tutoring. We need to get them some, some special help. Or it might be in a relationship situation where you're like, hey, things aren't going really well in our, our marriage, and, and we need to go to counseling. We almost intuitively begin to make decisions and begin to prioritize our life around things where we see that there's, it is time to have expected growth. And, and what happens is when we prioritize those things, and sometimes we prioritize, you know, they're, they're, they're not bad things, but they're good things. But what often t- happens is when we crowd out the calendar, as we crowd out our life, and we become busy and busy and busy, one of the things that begins to get neglected is our spiritual growth, is our spiritual life. And, and it's real easy, I don't know about you, but it's real easy to get, again, focused on good things. They're not bad things, but we f- get focused on good things, and we begin to neglect and, and forget about our spiritual life. And as we're trying to progress, we're not realizing that, hey, it's, it's time to grow spiritually. We need to be growing. And over time, we can just be completely apathetic to, in our spiritual life. You know, you get real busy with the kids, with our jobs. You know, I mean, look, I'm in the business world. I know. I mean, I used to leave when it was dark, and I would come home when it was dark. You know, 70 hours a week, easy. I ain't making that up. Um, I know what it's like to be in where you're, you're just busy, 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 busy. And, and you just kind of forget about your relationship with God. And you forget about the expected time for you and I to be growing. What happens is just like if you neglect your marriage and you get into a place in your marriage and things aren't going well, it's not an isolated situation. It will impact other areas in your life. It will impact your kids. It may impact your job. It can impact finances, whatever, financial situation. It's going to impact every other. You know, somehow, you know, unfortunately, we don't have these independent places where things are not going well. Usually, they're all kind of tied together. And what happens is we neglect our spiritual life it begins to impact other areas in our life. They're, 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 they co- they're, in, they're tied together, our spiritual life and everything else in our life. And what happens is when we neglect that in our life, it can be like drifting in the ocean. You know, when you're in the ocean, you drift, and, and you look up, and you're like, where am I? <laughs> you know, like, where's everybody at? And, and what happens is when we begin to neglect our spiritual growth and our spiritual life is that we can end up being in places that we never thought we would be. And sometimes with people that we never thought we would be with. The danger of spiritual complacency. 
So how do you move out of spiritual complacency? Maybe you're here in life and you're like, I feel like I'm a little complacent. I feel a little bit stagnant. How do you move out of a place of complacency to to a place of growth? And how can you and I be aware of things in our life that actually begin to hinder us from that progress? And how can you and I be aware of those things so that we can recognize them when they come and we can make steps and actions to to be able to, to eliminate those things from our life or to be able to not allow those things in our life to crowd out what God wants to do um, in our life. We're going to take a look this morning at a group of people who have become spiritually complacent, a, a, a community of people. And just like us, the busyness of life and the priorities in life, they misalign priorities, and they begin to think that it's just not time right now. It's just not time to, to be about what God has called us to do. We're busy with other things. We're build, busy building our houses. As I said a minute ago, they begin to suffer consequences in their life for that. We're going we're gonna to get into that some of that next week. But they've got some misplaced, misplaced priorities, and their spiritual apathy lasted for 16 years. That's a long time. Anybody ever been there before? Long time. And you don't even know it. And you're like, where's my beach house? Where's God? What, what church do I go to? You know? Do, is it God even real? So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at this old story. We're going to take a look at this, um, the record of this old story. And it's an old story. It's an ancient story. But it's a true story. It's a historically, um, you know, it's a historical story. Because all stories are historical. But um, I guess if it's not true. But it's a true, it's a true story. Okay. And, um, and we're going to see what happens with these group of people. Because they begin to encounter the same challenges that you and I did. It's an ancient story, but it's the same story. And they're going to encounter certain challenges. And we're going to see how they responded to it. And see how God responds to it. And again, this morning I want us to take a look. How, how you and I can move from spiritual complacency in our life. Let me give you a little background before we jump into the scripture. Is... Um, uh, the nation of Israel, and when you read the story of the Bible, the nation of Israel, you know, they're, they were, they're God's people, and they had kings, and the kings weren't really listening to the prophets. And so as a result of that, God says, he, he brings the prophets, said that God's going to bring judgment, he's going to bring discipline. So eventually he takes uh, the nation captive, and they go in, uh, they're taken captive by Babylon, they're in another nation. And so they are um, still God's people, but they're living in Babylon, and they're being influenced by the Babylonian culture. Um, and crazy thing is Babylon, uh, Bab- um, Babylon gets taken over by Persia. And it, at some point, the Persian king, God speaks to the Persian king, hello, and says, hey, um, God's told me for you guys to go back. Go back to Jerusalem and to go back to build the temple. Because, see, the temple had been destroyed uh, when they were taken captive. And, and to help us understand this, the temple was everything to these people. It was central to their spiritual life, the temple. And it's in ruins. It's as if like their spiritual life is in ruins. So underneath this guy who doesn't even believe God, like is not even a follower of God, he says, God's told me you guys need to go back and start rebuilding the temple. So they go back and they start rebuilding the temple. <clears throat> and it's great. You know, they're ha- having a great time, I'm sure. And, um, you know, so around 50,000 people end up coming back and, and they're rebuilding the temple and they get the foundation laid um, and an altar there, and um, it stops. The building project stops, and it stops for 16 years. And you're thinking, you guys are here for a reason and here for a purpose. What's going on? And at the 16th year, 520 B.C., a prophet named Haggai, God sends to these people, and he speaks to these people and he encourages them to get back on track. So let's take, I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read this chapter one, this story of this prophet Haggai. As he's speaking to this nation, the, the, these group of people who have advocated their spiritual responsibility, who are no longer building God's house, who are actually living in their own plush houses. And we're going to see what, as Haggai speaks to these people. Um, and then I'm going to talk about some, some of these um, barriers that they experienced to spiritual growth. So I'm going to go ahead and read this whole story to us, okay? So it's 15 verses. So chapter, uh, chapter 1 in Haggai, it's only two chapters. But chapter 1, verse 1. In the second year of Darius the king, the sixth month on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai, the prophet, of, the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and Joshua, the son of Jehoshadak, the high priest. 
Thus says the Lord of hosts, these people say the time has not come to rebuild the house of the Lord. See, they're like, it's not time. We got other things going on. They're like, it's not time. It wasn't that they didn't have time. They just said it wasn't time. And God says, okay. Um, I don't know if he said that, but in verse 3. <clears throat> then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have so much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them into a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the hills, bring wood and build the house, that I may take pleasure in it, and that I might be glorified says the Lord. You look for much, and behold, it came to a, to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, declares the Lord of hosts, because of my house that lies in ruins, while each of you busies himself with his own house. Therefore the heavens above you have withheld the dew, and the earth was withheld, has withheld its produce. And I have called for a drought on the land, and the hills, on the grain, the new wine, the oil, and what the ground brings forth on man and beast and all of their labors. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtuel, and Joshua, son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God um, had sent him. And the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke to the people with the Lord's message. I am with you, declares the Lord. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, on the 24th day, 24th day of the month, in the sixth month, in the second year of Darius the king. So in 23 days, 23, 24 days, there was a turnaround in these people. So let me... I wanted to read that story because I wanted to give you guys just a flavor of what's going on. But as I went through this, this past week, I realized there's kind of two different parts of it that I want to talk about. And I realized it was going to be too much to put in one sermon. I know you guys would love to like be here for like an hour and a half, um, listen to everything. And so um, what I decided to do is to cut it in half. So I'm going to do the second half next week of chapter 1. So actually what we're doing here is we're actually not even going to be talking much about what I just read. But what we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about the backstory because what we just read is the cover story. But there's a backstory to what's going on in the people of Israel. What caused them to stop building? Because everybody's got we we see everybody's cover story, but we often don't know people's backstory. And a lot of times we start judging people on the cover story. But we all have a backstory. Well, these people have a backstory. So what 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 happened? What why did I got to come on the scene? And these guys commissioned by God, what is going on? Well, we're going to have to, we have to take a look at another book called Ezra in the Old Testament that's parallel with the time period here. And we're going to take a glimpse and to see what barrier they first experienced that caused them to get off track and to begin their spiritual complacency. And it's this, it's external, external opposition. They began to get opposition. You ever experienced that before in your life? You're trying to do something, and you got opposition. And what happens is they begin to get this opposition in their life, and they begin to interpret the opposition as if God must not be in this. It must not be time, because we wouldn't be experiencing the trial. We wouldn't be experiencing this opposition, but they missed it. They didn't understand the opportunity in the midst of the opposition. So <clears throat> I'm going to take a look, and we're going to see a few things about this opposition that they experienced, because it's the same opposition that you and I experience in our life. And some of you might be experiencing it right now, this morning, in your life. But we're going to look at Ezra chapter 4, just a couple of verses here. Ezra chapter 4, it's the same timeline, okay? So as these people are, are building God's temple, when they came back, they're building it, a group of Samaritans, half Jews, half other people, they worshiped other gods, they come back and they say, hey, we want to play. We want to build. And Zerubbabel and them, they say, yeah, no, you can't touch this. Um, I mean, they MC hammered them, and they couldn't be a part of the building project, and they said, no, you can't. And so they got mad. They got angry. 
And it's unbelievable what these people did, okay? Look in Ezra uh, chapter 4, verse 4 and 5. It says, then the people of the land, that's the, the Samaritans, the people that uh, were not God's people coming back <clears throat> from Persia. So the people of the land discouraged the people of Judah and made them afraid to build and bribe counselors against them to frustrate their purpose. All the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. Listen, they... they, they they get upset, they hire attorneys, and they send them back over to Persia, and they get a cease and desist order from the government to shut it down. That wouldn't happen today. Sure. <clears throat> Let me read verse 21 of chapter 4. Uh, Therefore, make a decree that these men, this is the king, um, not Cyrus, another king. Therefore, make a decree that these men be made to seize in that the city be not rebuilt until a decree is made by me. And take care not to lack, not to be slack in this manner. Why should damage grow to the hurt of the king? And so, so the king gives them this letter, and they read this letter, and they're basically, look, you can't do it anymore. They're getting threatened. They're, they're discouraged. They're afraid. And the government shut them down. They're not building anymore. That's how that whole thing started. That's how the 16 years started. Listen, our external opposition can stop you from following God. Amen. <clears throat> we all get opposition. You know, hey, government, can, we can get opposition from the government. We get opposition from friends, families, coworkers. You know, you're, you're trying to follow God and, and people start ridiculing you. You know, we talk about peer pressure with kids and how kids, you know, they're, oh, there's peer pressure. We get, when did we not get peer pressure? I mean, we get peer pressure too. We're just older and taller, at least some of us, you know. But you get afraid. You're in a work environment and you're afraid to maybe say something about Christ. Or you're afraid to say something about your faith because you don't know what the, what, what the, the, the pushback's going to be. We get opposition all the time. Sometimes the greatest opposition can be from our old family, Hello? It could be from our own family. So here's <clears throat> about our external opposition. I want to mention this point. Discouragement is the gateway to deception. Discouragement is the gateway to deception. I'm going to go back in Ezra 4. Again, we're doing a backstory here on Israel. It says um, in Ezra 4, Then the people of the land discouraged the people of Judah. They were discouraged. One of the biggest weapons that the enemy is going to do in your life is to discourage you. To bring discouragement in your life. And that word discourage, <clears throat> it means that <clears throat> he's going to rob you of courage. He's going to take your courage away. Take away your will to keep going on. Take away your desire to continue to follow God. These people are trying to discourage God's people. And it's interesting because it, uh, in, in the Hebrew, that word discouraged... It means to sink or relax. You know when the Titanic sank? It's a massive ship. I mean, I know you probably weren't there. But this, you know, the Titanic sunk. I mean, this massive, huge ship, and it's lighting up the sky. It's lighting up the sea. And I couldn't imagine just these people watching this, this ship, you know, um, you know, begins to sink. And then, you know, the lights just go out. And all of a sudden, this massive boat all of a sudden just disappears like it wasn't even there. And there's no more light. Listen, when you and I are allowing discouragement to overwhelm us, our courage begins to just sink, and so does the light of Jesus. Are you discouraged this morning? Where are those points of discouragement in your life? One of the key things that the enemy will do is to try to discourage you, to take your courage away. They're, they are discouraged. Matter of fact, <clears throat> again, discouragement is the gateway to deception. Um, look at these verses in Hebrews. This is the New Testament. In Hebrews 3.12, it says, Take care, brothers, lest there be any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. See, what the author of Hebrews is telling us here, that make sure no one's fallen away. Why would they fall away? Because they have an unbelieving heart. An unbelieving heart is beginning to move people away. Well, how do you keep, them from, how do you keep that from happening? That's a great question. So God says in the next verse, 
But exhort one another every day. As long as it is called today that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. See, we are to encourage one another every day. Not Sunday, not Wednesday, but every day. Why? So that we're not deceived by sin and end up having an unbelieving heart. God's mechanism to help you and I from allowing discouragement to deceive us is to be able to, he builds in the body of Christ to exhort and to encourage one another. How many times can you come up here and share stories of deception in your life and it maybe started with discouragement? You see, you get discouraged in your marriage. And so you start thinking, there's a way out. God surely would not want this for me. Your kids, your job, discouragement, you, your mind starts playing tricks on you. And I bet most of us can come up here and say the time that we began to be deceived and walking away, it root issue was we are discouraged about something. You start questioning God, start wondering why is God allowing this to happen? And the enemy's like, I got you right where I want you. Keep thinking about it. They're never gonna change. Don't you hope? They're never going to look at you. Your kids are never going to change. Why are you going to church? What are you doing here? You're a fake. Don't act like your marriage is good. People saw what happened this morning. You know what I'm talking about? These thoughts that go through your head? Discouraging you. Discouragement is the gateway to deception. The discouragement that these people brought on God's people as they're rebuilding the temple deceived them to make them believe that it wasn't time. The the, the plan worked. They no longer had the courage to go on. And listen, we gotta be people of courage today. We gotta be courageous today. All through the Bible, it says be strong, be courageous. Following Jesus is not for the faint of heart. It is not for the faint of heart. Um, going back in this, this verse in Hebrews when it says to exhort, I, I love this, because it, ha, it comes from two root words, one called make, make a call, and one is close up and personal. So what he's saying when he says to exhort one another, you've got to get up close and personal with someone so you can make a call in their life. That's what it means to exhort one another. <clears throat> Remember the Super Bowl? I don't know if it's 2017, 16, 17, uh, Patriots played the Atlanta Falcons in, in, uh, uh, um, uh, in Houston. Um, and uh, they were down like 28-3. It was like greatest comeback ever. Sorry if you want to debate that with me afterwards. But it was an unbelievable comeback the Patriots had. But at some point in the game, Tom Brady throws his pass to uh, Julian Edelman. And it's a famous catch. And there's like three or four Atlanta defenders around him. And it's just Julian Edelman from the Patriots. And the ball jumps up in the air, and they all jump for it. And there's one Patriot guy and like three or four Atlanta Falcons. And somehow, some way, Julian Edelman caught the ball. And when you first see the play, you're like, oh, there's no way he caught it. But here's the deal. There was a <clears throat> referee on the field who was close enough to the play who said, that's a catch. That's a catch. And because that referee was close enough to see the play, to call the play, that, 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 that play went ahead and it was, it was considered a completion. We need to be on the field with people. We need to be on the field with one another so that we're close enough to say, that's a catch or that's God or that's not God. I've heard it said that people, um, and that, that does require some vulnerability. <clears throat> I've heard someone say that if you lack vulnerability in your life, Discouragement is a constant companion. Where are you discouraged? Are you discouraged this morning? Who needs to be encouraged in your life? Discouragement is the gateway to deception. So not only do we see that, that, that this, discour- this external opposition, it comes through discouragement, that it comes from fear. It comes from fear. Look in verse, uh, again, 4 and 5. It says, Then the people of the land discouraged the people of Judah and made them afraid to build and bribed counselors against them to frustrate their purposes. 
Fear oftentimes accompanies discouragement. And fear, man, <clears throat> it can be very debilitating, paralyzing. You know, I mean, we, we, there's so many phobias, I couldn't even, we'd be up here all day talking about all the phobias. You know, and there's a, there's a phobia of phobia. <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> thank you. <laughs> Appreciate that. There you go. So, but fear is very real. You fear what happens, what's going to happen to your kids. You fear that they're not going to get ahead. You fear that you're not going to get ahead. You fear what's going to happen to your money. And we fear so many things, but we don't ever fear God. But fear is a very real thing. And these people were afraid. Listen to this. Courage is not the absence of fear. It exists in the face of fear. Courage is not the absence of fear. It exists in the face of fear. All through the Bible, God says, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Why does he tell us to not be afraid? See, I told you I'm growing. Um, because <clears throat> he knows that we're going to face fear. Fear of rejection, fear of the unknown, you know, fear of uncertainty, all, all, whatever fear you have of roaches, I don't know what it is. But listen, courage. Listen, we, we need to be courageous people. These people have had their courage robbed with them, stolen from them. And sometimes I look out in the culture today and I feel like, man, man there's been a work done and, and the church has been robbed of its courage. It takes courage to go back in there with your kids. It takes courage to go back in there with your marriage. It takes courage to stay in there with your job, to dig in, to stand in and say, I'm not leaving. I'm going to stand, and it's hard, and I know the weight's come on me, but I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to stand firm, and I'm going to continue to move forward. I know it's not easy at times, but listen, God is able. As he spoke to them in Haggai 1, he says, I am with you. But we got to be courageous people. There was a whole nation that were lined up to, to fight Goliath. A whole nation, and they were scaredy cats, and they wouldn't fight Goliath. And a little 12-year-old shepherd boy came up, and he had courage. And said, no, my God is able. Our God is able to overcome fear in our life. <clears throat> the, um, my family watched a movie on Friday night, because we do Friday night movie nights. You're welcome to come over if you want. But um, we watched The Truman Show. Anybody ever seen The Truman Show? It's a great show. <clears throat> and this whole show, those of you, I'm sure you're familiar with it, it's all make-believe, right? They're, he's in a bubble, he's in a world, and everybody, they're all actors, and they're all, they're all there to manipulate. This guy was born in a make-believe world, grows up in a make-believe world, living in a make-believe world, and the whole world is outside watching this thing. You're like, that's kind of twisted. What's twisted in the show is actually the fact that in the show, in the movie, there's people in the, in the movie that are actually watching the show. That's what's kind of twisted. I mean, how many reality shows do we watch? Right? <clears throat> so all through this movie, they don't want them to leave the island, right? Because it's, it's, not, it's not the whole world. It's just this, 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 this dome. <clears throat> and so um, they have his dad killed. Like his dad dies when he's a kid on the, the fake ocean. And what they're doing is they're trying to create fear in him so that he doesn't want to, to get off the island. And all through this, you watch the movie, there's radio things on, and it's coming through the radio, it's coming through uh, newspapers, it's all about like, oh, there's this tragedy here, it's like, oh, thank goodness we live in this area here, you don't want to leave this area, it's comfortable. You know, he goes to this travel agency, because at this time in the movie, he's trying to figure out like something's not right, I'm trying to get out of here, and on, on the travel agency, there, there's this poster that has a plane with a, a bolt of lightning striking through it, you know? <clears throat> it's like, they got to set it up, even in that moment when they think maybe he's going to make a decision to leave, we got to get something in front of him that it's going to make him afraid. Listen, we live in a world that's trying to make you and I afraid and scared. And we need to be courageous. So finally, Truman, he comes to his senses and he gets on his boat, you know, because the whole thing is like he didn't want to cross water. And he's going to have to cross water to get out. And so in order to do that, he had to get in the boat and they end up causing a big storm, and he almost drowns. It's crazy. But he finally gets to the very end, and he runs into that wall. And you're like, wow, man, he made it. He made it. And he goes up to that door and opens the door, and the creator of the show starts speaking to him through the sky. Fake sky, but sky. And he's like, don't, basically, I'm paraphrasing this, but he's like, don't do it. 
you have no idea what you're stepping into. This is your life here. And Truman has the courage to step right through that door into a new life. Listen, what door are you at right now? What door is open in your life? And what are the voices telling you to not go through it? We got to be courageous and trust God with what he's doing in our life. So not only do we see in here, we see that the, the discouragement brings de, is a gateway to deception. We also see that courage is not the absence of fear, but it exists in the face of fear. Let me uh, <clears throat> go back. We're going to read one, uh, maybe a couple of verses in Haggai 1. So let's know. Now that's the backstory of what's going on here, right? The backstory of reason of why they stopped building is because they were intimidated. They were, um, uh, they were discouraged and they were afraid. That's why they initially stopped. And that's why oftentimes you and I will stop following God in our life. <clears throat> but look at Haggai verse 1. In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai, the prophet of Zerubbabel, the son of Sheotul, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehoshadak, the high priest. Listen, in the 16th year, God shows up and God gives a specific word to a specific person to give to a specific people for a specific purpose. God's word, will, he will speak specifically to you and I, specifically about a situation in your life, about specific people in your life. And this whole thing changes because somebody comes in and, and, and gives the word of God, which is the will of God. And, and he challenges them, right? He says, look, you guys are doing your panel houses. We'll talk about that next week. But, but he challenges them, but he encourages them to, to turn back around and to do the thing that God has called them to do. And if you and I want to find encouragement, you and I find encouragement from God in God's word. And the reason why I put, I was, gonna say, I was talking to Pat about this. I was going to say you find encouragement from God's word or from God. But if you want to find encouragement from God, you need to be in God's word. And God's word encourages these people challenges them, but exhorts them to come back to what God called them to do. <clears throat> and, you know, I'm going to uh, go down to verses 13 and 14 in this chapter. I'm going to read this. It says, Then Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke to the people with the Lord's message. I am with you, declares the Lord. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts their God. God's word was impactful. God's word affected them. God's word caused them to change. They heard God's word. And listen, <clears throat> you and I need to be in places where we're hearing God's word preached. We need to be listening to God's word. We need to hear God's word preached. And we need to preach God's word. I'm up here preaching today, but you're preachers. We need to be preaching, like back in Hebrews when it says to encourage one another, to exhort one another. We need to be preaching to one another, exhorting one another, because it's the word of God that will encourage us. Listen, I know it's hurtful. I know it's painful. But listen, God is faithful. You can trust him. He's not going to leave you. He will never forsake you. There's a, there's a reason why this is going on. God is going to turn all things and cause all things to work for good for those that love him. God has a purpose in this. I don't know why, but listen, God loves you. He's got a plan. He's going to work all things out. Stay with him. God is with you. That's what we're talking about. When people are discouraged, you coming in and you bring in encouragement to their life. God is faithful. God is real. God God is true. We're not talking about attaboys. Go get them, tiger. We're talking about preaching to people, encouraging them in God's word. <clears throat> when, when Sunshine's thing happened uh, with her aneurysm a couple years ago, you know, well, the boys and I were going through the story of Joseph, and that story will preach story of Joseph. And, you know, he's in prison and he's going through, you know, all the stuff's happening to him. I'm just telling you, I was standing in front of the bed because they slept in our bed when she was in the hospital and they're in, they're, we do our devotional and I'm standing in front of the bed and I'm, I'm literally preaching. I'm, I'm saying, listen, Joseph doesn't know what's going on. We know God had a plan. Listen, we don't know what's going on with mommy, but God's got a purpose and God's got a plan. And I was preaching to myself and I was preaching to them, but we were finding encouragement through the word of God. <clears throat> I 
God's word stirs us. I love that word stir. It, it, it moves us to action. That's the power of God's word. <clears throat> the uh, 1982 NC State basketball team, they played the NCAA championship. They beat uh, U of H. And I remember watching this kid. It was a very emotional thing for me because I was very distraught. The Houston lost. But there's a good spiritual analogy here. Um, and Jim Valvano is the coach of NC State. And at that time, U of H, the five slamma jamma, you know, Akeem the Dream, Clyde the Glide, uh, Drexler. And so they were just running up and down the court, just slamming and dunking. And, and <clears throat> they're interviewing Jim Valvano, the coach of NC State, before the game. And like, how are you going to handle all this stuff? And he's like, well, we're just going to hold on to the ball. Is we're going to practice today at 2 o'clock, and we're probably not going to do anything until 3.30. We're just going to hold the ball. He's just saying, like, our strategy is to get, keep the ball away from him because he'll just dominate. <clears throat> just before the game, he's in the locker room with his players. And he goes up to him. He says, we're not holding the ball. Are you crazy? This is the time now. And to his players, he says, wit. You're going to go take your shot. Sydney, you're going to run the show. Thurl Bailey, you're going to knock down shots. We're not going to hold the ball. We're going to shove it down their throat. And he gave them every bit of ammunition in that moment to go out and to play that game. And if you watch the tape of that game, they came out on fire. And one of the assistant coaches says, man, in that moment, Jim Vavano, he took those kids from here to here. He goes, and they didn't run through the door. They ran through the brick wall. That's the power of words. And that's the power of what God's word can do in our life. You got a game in front of you. And it looks like a very difficult task. And God says, listen, this is what we're going to do. And everything that I am, everything that I have is in you. And I'm going to lead you and I'm going to guide you. I'm going to empower you. I'm going to equip you. I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. The word of God is an encouragement to us. So this morning, are you discouraged? <clears throat> Is there anything, opposition, that you may be facing in your life that's got you down, that has discouraged you, that you're afraid of? What is God speaking to you about this morning? My prayer and hope is that God's word would stir our hearts to begin to move towards him and to move with him. Oliver's going to play a song here, just a response time, and I'm just going to be up here.